chill wind blew from the east. Night was gathering over the shapeless lands before them. The sickly green of them was fading to a sullen brown. Far away to the right, the Anduin, that had gleamed fitfully in sunbreaks during the day, was now hidden in shadow. But their eyes did not look beyond the river, back to Gondor, to their friends, to the lands of men. South and east they stared to where, at the edge of the oncoming night, a dark line hung like distant mountains of motionless smoke. Hey everyone, Yoiston here, and I hope you all are doing well, wherever you are in Middle-earth. Today we are continuing our subseries of the Region Spotlight playlist concerning the lesser-known lands of Middle-earth. Today we'll be discussing Dunland, Enedwyth, Eridluin, the Vales of Anduin, the Emin Wheel, and the Iron Hills. Please check out the sources in the description and cards, my friends. Thank you all so much for joining me. Let's begin our tale. Throughout the history of Middle-earth, Dunland, meaning Dark Land, acted as a place where people would go when they were driven out of their previous homes. It was a green, forested place, west of the southernmost part of the Misty Mountains. In the Second Age, it was the middlemen near Tharbad and the forests of Minhiriath and so forth who were driven out of their forested lands as the Numenorians came and cut down the trees there to build their ships. Likely, there were already a number of people living in and around Dunland before the arrival of the Numenorians and so forth, who were related to the Easterlings of the First Age, or the Dunlandings of later ages. Before the founding of the Shire, but after the hobbits left the Vales of Anduin in the Third Age, some stores would settle near the angle of Mithethil and down into Dunland. Eventually, they would leave Dunland for their new home in the Shire, however. The people who did reside in Dunland during the Great Plague in 1636 and 1637 did suffer but far less than others due to their isolation. Continuing with our theme of Dunland being a land of exile, after the Aethade came into Rohan and became the Rohirrim after 2510, the men who lived in the lands of Calanarthon beforehand fled over the Eisen River into Dunland, swelling the numbers of the Dunlandings. Finally, after the fall of Erebor in 2770 of the Third Age, the dwarves of Erebor would wander and find refuge in Dunland themselves. Eventually, they would move on to Arid Luin. And of course, with Sauron residing at Isengard at the edge of Dunland, he would utilize the power of his voice to further enrage those people who lived there, and spur them on against the Rohirrim during the War of the Ring. Dunland would likely either be incorporated into the realm of Arnor or Gondor, or left to be its own separate land, under the control of the Dunlandings. In part one of this subseries, I looked at Minhiriath, which has a history which is quite similar to Enedwyth, Therefore, I won't quite reiterate what I discussed in that region, but it is worth noting that many of the events that Minhiriath went through also affected Enedwyth, or the Middle Region. Between the rivers Gwathlo and Isen, to the south of Minhiriath and the west of Dunland, and to the southwest of Aregion, Enedwyth is a heavily wooded land between rivers. And it seems that Dunland was even a sub-region of Enedwyth, and it was home to men before the coming of the Numenorians men who would be classified by Numenorians not as middlemen but as men of shadow, as they did not recognize the kinship between themselves and any common ancestors, even though some of the earliest inhabitants of Dunland were likely related to the House of Haleth. Furthermore, at the edge of Enedwyth, it seems that some Druidine lived at the mouths of the Gwathlo and Isen rivers. Once the lands of Enedwyth made up some of the northern border of Gondor, as it connected into Eriador, yet it was never really settled except by the Numenorians and Dunlandings who lived there. Likely well into later ages, it would be reincorporated into Rohan, northern Gondor, or would be a part of the lands of the Dunlandings. The Arid Luin, or Blue Mountains, were far to the northwest of Dunland and Enedwyth, west of the Shire, and east of the sea. In the early ages, the Blue Mountains were formed when Middle-earth was pushed further away from Valinor, to protect the uttermost west. Before the fall of Beleriand in the First Age, two fathers of the dwarves, the Broadbeams and Firebeards, awoke in the Blue Mountains, under Mount Dolmed. The clans of these dwarves would create the two great dwarven cities of Nograd and Belagost. These made up the eastern wall of Assyriand, the land of the Seven Rivers, and a great dwarf road ran through these areas. Yet at the end of the First Age, with the fall of Beleriand, the dwarven cities went the same way as that western land creating many dwarven refugees who would migrate to Khazad Dûm in the Misty Mountains, and the Arid Luin was also changed by the catastrophe. 
There would remain a few dwarves on the eastern parts of the Blue Mountains, those that survived at least, near the Loon River and new elven settlements to the east and south. The Blue Mountains certainly held a future for more dwarves, but also for a man, or a man with his entire company. For after the fall of Fornost and the Third Age and the flight of Arvidui, the last king of Arthodyne would eventually take refuge in a mine far in the north of the mountain range, likely as it stretched into Forokel. Eventually, after the fall of Erebor, the War of the Dwarves and Orcs and their time in Dunland, King Thrain II moved his people to new halls in the Blue Mountains in 2802 of the Third Age. Within these halls, he and his son Thorin Oakenshield would rule until the retaking of Erebor, yet these mines and halls would remain a home of the dwarves well into the Fourth Age. Far to the east, in Rovanion, between the Misty Mountains and the Greenwood, later Mirkwood, the Vales of Anduin were northern lands along either side of the Great River, including the Gladden Fields. Within these lands, it was elves coming west who first came and dwelt here, some who would go no further west, others who originally stayed in the east before branching out in Middle-earth. Some of these would stay and establish themselves in the Great Forest, becoming the Sylvan Elves, while others would eventually move on south and west, but not to Valinor. Eventually, men came to dwell here, those who were related to the three houses of the Adain, who had come to Beleriand. And these men would form a trading confederation between themselves, Elves of the Forest, and the Dwarves of the Misty Mountains during the Second Age. Eventually, these men would also mix with those of the Kingdom of Rovanion, and become the Woodmen of the Forest, while only a few others would become the Bjornings, and most would become the Eothaid. Eventually, during the Third Age, the wizard Radagast would also come to dwell in Ruskabel, quite close to these lands. Darkness would spread in this area through the Age, with the death of Isildur in the Gladden Fields near the beginning, the fall of Angmar on the other side of the mountains later on, and the rise of Dol Guldor. Eventually, even after building their settlements and homes, the Eothaid would go south to save Gondor during the Battle of the Field of Celebrant, and these men would be granted the lands of Kalanarthon to dwell in, becoming the Rohirrim of Rohan, and leaving the Vales behind. However, the Vales of Anduin would remain to the Woodmen and Bjornings, and whatever dangers lurked there. South of the Vales of Anduin, and east and south of the Falls of Rauros, we have the Eminwheel, the Drear Hills. These rocky, inhospitable lands did not see many of the events through the history of Middle-earth. From the middle of the Third Age, the eastern side of the Anduin at this point served as a boundary for Gondor and later Rohan, but even in times of war it was quite impassable, especially for large hosts. In 3002, Eomund, Eomer and Eowyn's father was slain by orcs here, but this is perhaps the only battle seen here throughout the Legendarium. Later in 3017, Aragorn took Gollum through the Emin Wheel to the north to evade servants of the enemy. Finally, in 3019, Frodo and Sam encountered Gollum here, who led them out towards the Dead Marshes and the Black Gate. While this area was probably never settled or transformed, really, it would likely continue to serve as a boundary for Gondor and Rohan in some capacity. Again, due to its harsh nature and terrain, nothing of great note really would ever happen here. Finally for today, we have the Iron Hills. It seems that the roots of the Longbeards reach far back in the history of these lands, as the dwarves of khazad established an outpost here, which were made up of iron ore mines near the base of the Karnan River, sometime during the First Age. And the road from the Iron Hills, which was far to the east, even more east of the river running and Erebor, went all the way into the west. However, even in the wars and catastrophes throughout the ages, the Iron Hills continued to survive as a refuge for the folk of Durin, even if the trade between it and other lands on that road were interrupted. After the Balrog took Moria in 1980, and Drakes drove Longbeards from the Grey Mountains in 2590, and Smaug took Erebor in 2770, the Iron Hills were always a place where dwarven refugees could go. In 2591, Gror, the brother of Thror, would move many of his dwarves to these lands, creating the lineage that would eventually lead to Dane, Ironfoot, and Thorin III, and eventually Durin VII. The dwarves of the Iron Hills would contribute many warriors during the War of the Dwarves and Orcs, the Battle of Five Armies, and likely the Battle of Dale in the late Third Age, since Easterlings came and attacked the northern lands. Since the Iron Hills had always been a dwarven colony, it would probably remain as such. As it seems that for the Longbeards, the Iron Hills was the longest lasting territory of theirs that never suffered a great catastrophe. And so, with the strength and endurance of the Iron Hills, 
come to the end of part two in our subseries of the lesser known lands of Middle Earth. From these lands we looked at today, we see that even places that do not stand as very notable in the annals of history may serve as a refuge and salvation for people. All lands hold their own strengths. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you all enjoyed today's video. If you did, please be sure to hit that like button and share this with a friend. What are your thoughts on the lands of today? Let me know in the comments below. Tolkien's world building never ceases to amaze me. And these lands, which are all mentioned but have little to no renown in the main events of the stories, show the incredible depth of the Legendarium. If you'd like to support the channel, please consider getting some candles from our friends Mythology Candles, or order us some Weta or United Cutlery, Lord of the Rings sword statues, and other replicas from Castle Khan, who does international shipping, and use the code WEST at checkout, and please check out our merch and Patreon. Thanks to our Valor tier patrons and YouTube members, Peter Shepard, Jonathan Putnam, Blair Scout and Merton, John Hume, Sam McBee, Elizabeth Calvert, Maz Gibbs, Reese Jenkins, Adam Petrolick, Anthony Harmon, Arthur, Merlin, Dale Davis, Kingswald Project, Robert Bogue, King of Games 2500, and Theodore. Thank you so much to all of our patrons and YouTube members. Please subscribe and hit that bell button to join the Men of the West and all of the free peoples today. And I'll see you all again next week with a video on the original purpose of the Rings of Power. The artifacts, not the show. My friends, thank you all so much for joining me on this adventure. Until the next one.